So what we're going to look at today is we're going to be looking at rules of inference for quantifiers. So we're going to be looking at the existential quantifier and the universal quantifier, and we're going to say, okay, well, how is it that I in fact can state that I have a universal quantifier be true? Or how is it that I can state that I have an existential quantifier be true? And then what do I do that from the symbolic logic standpoint? In the case of the existential quantifier, it's actually a pretty simple process, okay? So the process is basically saying, all right, I want to show that one exists. So I have one thing that exists and actually states and, and says that this predicate is going to be true for that one. So all I've got to do is I've just got to find an example. So basically, once I find that example, then I can say, okay, well, now I know the, the statement exists, all right, or that predicate exists. For the universal quantifier, it's going to be a little bit more tricky, and we'll get into this a, a bit more in, in a bit. What I have to do is I'm going to have to show it for all the elements of the domain. That, um, in fact, the predicate is true for all the elements of the domain. Now, that's kind of hard. And the reason why that's kind of hard is because sometimes our domain is universal, right? We've got, or excuse me, not universal, but um, infinite, like the set of integers, the set of all real numbers, the set of all rational numbers. The, those are infinite sets. You can't go through and like prove by exhaustion that every single one of the elements in that set is in fact going to make it true. So what we're going to use is we're going to use this idea of arbitrariness. Now there are definitions for arbitrariness or arbitrary uh, elements, but they are kind of hard to understand, I think, and I don't think they illuminate things very well. The basic idea of arbitrariness is to imagine that you've got just the average element in a set, okay? So an example of this is that if you were to pick an even number, an arbitrary even number would have the quality that it's divisible by two. And so every even number is divisible by two. And so to prove universalness, we're gonna take an unknown element, a variable, but one, a variable that we know is going to be divisible by two. That's, it's got, it's got that definition piece. And then we'll prove that our predicate is true for that arbitrary element. And this, I don't know why I used air quotes, who knows? right? For that arbitrary element, right? That one that's divisible by two. Or we might say for a rational number, and then we need a definition of a rational number because we're going to have a variable term that has the qualities of a rational number, and then we're going to show that our statement, in fact, is true for that, um, uh, for that unknown rational number, but that has all the characteristics and qualities of a rational number. Okay, and that way we can say, well, we showed it was true for this one that was kind of an unknown that had the quality of a rational number, so that must be mean that it's true for all rational numbers. Okay, and it's a it's a little bit of a leap of logic or a leap of a um, uh, yeah a leap of logic, but in fact it ends up working out. And if you spend some time thinking about it, it, it really does show you that we have the predicate be true universally for every element inside of the domain. Okay. So we're going to get into that a little bit more too, but I just want to kind of lay it out um, that we're going to get this idea of arbitrariness and I'm going to be using it and I want you to kind of pay attention to what it means to be arbitrary, right? Because that's going to actually help us understand universal, uh, um, using the rules of inference for universal quantifiers. So our first rule of inference for quantifiers is this idea of universal instantiation. So the goal of the rule of inference is to prove that the predicate is true for a particular element within the domain. And what we're going to have as our hypotheses is we're going to have that we have a particular element in the domain, whatever it looks like. And then what we're going to show is that for all elements within that domain, the statement or, and then the second piece of our hypothesis is that for every element in the domain, a statement is true. So consequently, it's true for that particular element. Okay. And let me write this down for you. So what we'll do is we'll start out with our hypotheses. And our first hypothesis is that C is a particular element. And then we have for all x, p of x. And it's a particular element in the domain. So those are our hypotheses. We're gonna make the assumption that they are true. We're gonna be given for all x, p of x. And then anytime you want to, all you can do is you can pick any element inside of the domain, whether it's arbitrary or um, particular, okay? And then as long as it has the qualities of the element in the domain, or that it's in the domain, then you can actually say it's it goes along with for all x, p of x. And you can just state it. You're like, okay, let's pick an element, right? Say, for example, we're looking at a rational number. You're like, I'm going to pick one half. One half is a rational number. Once I know that that's true, my therefore, and this makes a lot of sense, therefore, p of c is true. 
meaning that the predicate ends up being true for the element inside of the particular domain. So an example of this would be like this. Let's say we declare our domain to be rational numbers. So we have one half as a rational number. Then we know a statement that happens to be true about all rational numbers. So for all rational numbers, if x does not equal zero, then x has a multiplicative inverse. So what is it that we can con conclude? Well, if you think about it, it's pretty simple in terms of what we can conclude logically. Therefore, one half has a multiplicative inverse, right? One half does not equal zero, therefore one half has a multiplicative inverse. So you can see that what we have is we've declared an element in the domain, okay? We know a universal statement that for all rational numbers, this statement is true. So consequently, what must be true? It must be true for one half because one half happens to be a member of that set. Our next uh, rule of inference for quantifiers is called existential instantiation. And so these are the instantiation ones. And we're gonna talk a bit about what we do with them logically, but the goal here for existential uh, instantiation is to say that there is an element in the set and that element has the quality in the predicate. So what we have here, we're gonna start with there exists an X such that P of X, and that's gonna end up being my hypothesis. And then what we get from my conclusion is we're gonna get two things. Therefore, we'll have P of C that's a particular element inside of the set, or yeah, it's gonna be a particular element in the set, and P um, and C is an element in the set. And I think actually for us, we write it the other way around, but this is fine, okay? Actually, let's do it the other way around. We're gonna have C as an element in the set and P of C. So those are the statements that we get when we state that we have the existence of an element. And it seems almost, well, I, I don't know. It seems almost um, obvious, but like, let's say for example, there exists an integer such that X plus one equals zero. And so that's our existence statement. Therefore, okay, negative one is an integer. We need that to be true. And that is true. And negative one plus one equals zero. Okay, and it happens to have that quality. There it is. We know that there exists one, all right? And, and we have such that P, uh, x plus one equals zero. Sometimes we could actually find an example. Other times we might just say something like the, the, the statement C is an integer and we don't know what C is, it's an unknown. And, okay, C plus one equals zero, we might actually utilize a variable too. That's another option that we have, okay? Because sometimes what we get mathematically is we get something that we just can't go out and prove. Um, instead, what we've got to do is we've got to say, well, I know it exists because I've proven that it exists, um, but I'm not sure what it is, so it's enough for me to just know that it's there. So, when we, whenever we use existential instantiation, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the existential quantifier, and then we're going to say that we've got an element in the set, and that it is true, the predicate is true for that element. What I want you to notice here, just like inside of universal instantiation, is we went from the quantifier, okay, to unquantified statements. And you're going to see when we do proof, this is going to become very handy because what it's going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to actually remove the quantifiers so that we can use the other rules of inference. So the next rule of inference that we have here is called existential generalization. And unlike the instantiation pieces where what we're doing is we're starting with the, ex the quantifier, either the existential quantifier or the universal quantifier, in the case of the generalization rules of inference, what we're doing is we're starting out with non-quantified statements and then using them in order to show the quantified one. And in math, these are incredibly important because they become the basis for proof for a lot of our proof, right? A lot of times we wanna show that a, a statement is true for all elements in the set that's universal or that it is true for a single element in the set and hence we have something that's existential. So in the rule, we'll start out with the two hypotheses once again. And they are C is a particular element of the domain and P of C, right? So we've got an element in the domain and for that element, P of C is true. Well, what follows from there should make some sense. It's gonna get therefore, 
there exists an x, p of x. So if we know that c is in the domain and that p of c is true, then the existential quantifier is gonna end up being true. So if we look at an example, an example would be something like this. One is an integer, one squared equals one. Therefore, what's the conclusion that we can have? There exists an integer whose square is itself. Great, I now know that that exists. Why? Because I just showed that an element in the domain, the domain of integers, had a square that was in fact itself. So that's the idea of existential generalization. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show that a particular element belongs to the set, and then we are after that, we're gonna show that that element has a certain quality, and therefore there exists an element in the set that has that certain quality. So our last example now is, is universal generalization. And universal generalization really is the fundamental heart of proof in mathematics. So the purpose of this rule of logic is to show that a statement is true for all elements within the domain. So for every element that has a particular quality, right, we want to show that a particular statement is true. So like for example, C is an arbitrary, so how the rule is going to work, and then we're going to get into this a little bit more, is that we're going to start with C is an arbitrary element of the set. So C is an unknown value. We don't want to actually pick a particular value. We want to pick an unknown value that has the quality or characteristic of elements in the set. Okay, that's what it means to be arbitrary. And then we're going to show that P of C is true, all right? And then therefore, as a result, we get that for all X, P of X. The fact that we've picked an unknown element but that has a common characteristic of everything, every other element in the set actually allows us to then make the statement that it is true for all elements within the set. So let me give you an example. So we're gonna say, okay, we'll start out with, say for example, we have a, uh, a variable k. And so k is an arbitrary even number. And we pick any even number. So every even number, and they're gonna all have the same quality. We'll actually write them as something like um, k equals, 2j, right? That is, is that every even number is some other integer, right? j belonging to the integers is what we write, is some other integer multiplied by 2, right? And that's what is what makes it even. Even 0. 0 is an even number because it's 2 times 0. And then we'll say, okay, well, k squared minus k is even. Well, since k is just an arbitrary even number, if we show or we know that k squared minus k is even, those are our hypotheses Our conclusion then must be, by our rules of inference, that for all even numbers x, x squared minus x is in fact even. And that's a rule of inference. And if you think about it, it's like saying, okay, well, if I pick any one at random, they all have the same quality or characteristic, all have the same thing about them, right? So if I prove it for that one arbitrary element, then I've actually proven it for, itself, for all of it. And this one takes a little bit of thought but you're gonna to start to see that this is gonna become the foundation of proof. This is what we do when we do proof oftentimes. We'll see it a lot, especially inside of uh, our definition proof chapter. Um, but for right now, from a logical perspective, we're gonna start out with having an arbitrary element in the set, knowing in fact that for any arbitrary element in the set, um, the P of C is gonna end up being true, and then therefore, for all x, p of x is gonna end up being true, and we're just gonna utilize that as a logical rule of inference. So those are our four rules of inference. Um, we have uni uh, universal instantiation, existential instantiation, and those two are going to be used um, from a logical perspective or from a strict symbolic logic perspective to transform quantifiers into non-quantified statements. And then we have existential generalization and universal generalization, and those are gonna take um, non-quantified statements and they're gonna allow us to turn them into quantified statements from a symbolic logic perspective, okay? As you're working with these, uh, these two sets, the universal instantiation, existential instantiation, and the generalization uh, uh, sets of rules of inference, what I want you to do is I want you to think about, well, how does this get used practically? Okay, how does this get used practically and how might we use this in proof? Because these are gonna end up becoming really important as we start working inside of proof. And we can use them as kind of like foundation pieces there too. All right, so this finishes this uh, mini lecture on uh, rules of inference for quantifiers.